away Siemi Ingeta. Siemi. So this video is going to be called The Real J-E-S-U-S. J-E-S-U-S came back from 1918 to 1983. It's important to understand before we start this. Go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 12 through 15. We have to understand with scripture, this will give us more understanding because the creator allowed his word to be here for us to have understanding. Revelation chapter 1, verse 12 through 15. When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands. And standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. So this is the Savior. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. So we get a picture of the Savior. Wearing a robe, gold sash across his chest. His hair is white like wool, as white as snow. So it gives us a texture and it gives us a color. White like wool, white as snow. Wool hair. And his eyes were like the flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. So now we have a visual of J-E-S-U-S. -S. Says his hair was like wool. And his feet were like bronze refined in a furnace. Wool hair, bronze feet. One more scripture if we go to Daniel chapter 10 verse 6. His arms and feet shone like polished bronze and his voice roared like a vast multitude of people. So we're given a visual of the Savior. Now I'm a white man. And we're told that J-E-S-U-S, -S, the Savior, is a white man. But scripture says the exact opposite. Wool hair, polished bronze feet, arms and feet shone like polished bronze. That would make the Savior a colored man. So when I say that J-E-S-U-S -S came again from 1918 to 1983, because he did, the colored man with wool hair did come back, who was healing the blind, healing the deaf, raising the dead, telling people come back to the commandments, and then they tried to kill him. Cut him up into pieces, and then they res he was resurrected again. This is the story. This African man brought himself back to life after his body was chopped to pieces. They called him the Black Jesus. His name is Simon Gonsalves Toko. From 1918 to 1983, he was doing everything the Savior was doing. Now, the reason why I say that this is the Savior, because we know a tree by its fruit. If you see a tree, and it's a white tree, and then people say that that tree is the Savior, one, better be able to do this, what the Savior did. And two, it better look like the Savior looked 
in Scripture. If you looked at that white tree and everyone said, that's the Savior, and Scripture says, no, 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 the Savior isn't a white tree, the Savior is actually a bronze tree with wool hair. It's funny how white people started putting on wool wigs right around George Washington's time. And they're like, maybe they knew that the Savior had wool hair. So they had to, in case anybody read that scripture, we have to make sure that we have wool hair. Awful ironic. Now, this story about this man, Simon Toko. If we know a tree by its fruits... He not only fits the description of the Savior in Scripture, but he did everything the Savior did and was resurrected from the dead on the third day, not the second, like Good Friday to Saturday being one day and Saturday to being Sunday being two days he's resurrected, like the white J-E-S-U-S, but this colored man named Simon Toko. Listen to this story. Simon Toko, or Simeon Toko, was born on February 24th, 1918 in a village in northern Angola. Portentously named Sadibanza Zulumongo. Sadibanza Zulumongo. The newborn emerged from his mother's womb in a very hostile environment. For almost 50 years, from 1872 to 1921, this region suffered natural disasters. There were long droughts between short lulls. Northern Angola and the southern regions of the French and Belgian Congos were devastated. The resultant famines killed thousands. So, too, there were thousands of deaths brought by smallpox, typhoid, sleeping sickness, malaria, and other diseases. These different plagues represent the fulfillment of a biblical prediction. None but a few people inspired by the words of Zombie, the creator, recognized this. And the dragon stood before which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born, which is talked about in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. The baby, Simeon Toko, was born mere inches, for, mere inches from sickness and famine and plague and death, and many leagues from safety. There was not much reason for a baby to want to live, and much against it, the infant Toko caught smallpox. Just one moment. Uh, the different plagues represent the fulfillment of a biblical prediction. Uh, yep, the infant Toko caught smallpox. He was so badly affected by it that villagers thought the hand of the Almighty Father alone saved his life and he was left with the unpleasant marring of smallpox scars on his face. Compare this prophecy. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Which is Isaiah 52 verse 14. Not long after Simeon's birth, a missionary at a Baptist missionary society based in Angola had a dream. He dreamed that a great king had been born in the region under his ministry. He decided to go looking for this baby. Requesting guidance from the Holy Spirit, he became the baby Simeon Toko. Staring at an infant so rachitic, like a weak and tender plant, which is in Isaiah 53. And with so blemished a little face, he shook his head. Doubt had to come to stay. He asked one or two questions and left, feeling victimized by his dream and the voice that had led him there. In 1949, Simeon attended an international conference of Protestants in Leopoldville, which was currently called Kinshasa. During this event, the ceremonial masters asked three Africans from Angola to pray. Those selected were Gaspar de Almeida, Jesse Chiulo, Chipenda and Simeon Toko. Simeon Toko asked in his public prayer that the Holy Spirit manifest in Africa 
to put an end to the abuses of the colonial powers. Toko became a dedicated member of the Baptist Church in Itaga. He formed a singing choir of 12 people. Notice that. Listen, because you'll notice the signs if you know anything about the Savior. He formed a singing choir of 12 people, like the 12 disciples. Instantly, this choir became famous, and from 12 members, it grew into hundreds. At each of the choir performances, whether at their church or while visiting another church, the Holy Ghost manifested with such a power that white missionaries suspected young Toko of possessing black magic powers. Jealously, the missionaries summoned him to abandon his dark practices. He responded to them by saying, But if we are praying to the same one, how come when I pray and there is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, you accuse me of sorcery? Is it because I'm an African that my powers couldn't possibly be answered? Does the Holy Spirit discriminate against Africans too? You can see this in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 10. But the missionaries were fed up with him and decided to exclude him from the church. Then what was meant to happen, happened. All those who would join the church on the inspiration of Simeon's magnificent choir left the church with him. The question was whether Simeon Toko would abandon these followers or keep them with him. He decided to keep them with him, realizing all the same that a very harsh duty awaited him. He decided to pray again to his father, repeating the same prayer he had made three years before the Baptist Conference. Then on July 25, 1949, Simeon and 35 members of his choir met on a street called Mayenge at the house of a man named Vanga Ambrosio. The choir began to sing, waiting for the time to pray. And shortly before midnight, Simeon Toko lifted his eyes to the sky and he addressed this prayer to his father. Zombie, I know you will answer my prayers. Now look, consider these sheep you have sent to me. This duty is so immense that without the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, we will never be able to achieve what you attended. The prayer I addressed to you three years ago, didn't you hear it? At precisely midnight, a strong wind shook the house in the Mwanda Valela. The Holy Spirit possessed everyone at the prayer meeting, with the exception of a man called Sansao and Falzi, the choir leader. And Zambi, who they called the Creator, let him remain in an ordinary frame of mind so that he could write down the testimonials and miracles taking place before his dumbfounded eyes. Many in the group were speaking in tongues. Sound familiar? Some saw heavenly light and heard celestial voices. Others were able to communicate clearly with people several kilometers and where, from where the prayer was taking place. The excitement about the miracles that happened at the New Pentecost led Simeon Toko's followers to spread all over the town and start preaching and building the kingdom of Ndambi. This attracted the attention of Belgian colonial authorities who viewed the activity as a threatening commotion. Within about three months, the police began jailing the preachers. They were jailed and prosecuted as promptly as were the Kimbanguists, the followers of Simon Toko's messenger, Simon Kimbangu, who himself was imprisoned from 1921 until his death in 1951. Some were beheaded, burned alive in their homes, drowned in the river, or shot without being prosecuted. Finally, the colonialists decided to deport them. The wives, husbands, and children were separated from their families and homes by hundreds and even thousands of kilometers. When miracles started taking place among the new followers of Kibangu, the Belgian authorities tried to supplicate the new messianic group at once. On October 22, 1949, Simeon Toko and 3,000 of his companions were put into two different jails, Ophiltra and Dolo. After th three months in the jails, a decree was passed to deport them out of the country. This is when Simeon Toko started revealing himself. The Belgian administration of the jail in Ndolo was named Pyrot. He abused the tokenist, Tokoist prisoners, hurling racist insults. He always ended with, Filthy N-I-G-G-E-R? You're going back to N-I-G-G-E-R country in Angola! Tired of this abuse, Simeon Toko replied sharply to Pyro, Know that if there is a stranger here, it is you. To show you that I am home, the day you make the injustice of deporting me from Belgian Congo, I'll have you carrying my bags alongside me. 
Simeon Toko held up both hands, spread out his fingers, and told the abusive Belgian to count them. He said, I give you ten years, not one more or less, to leave this country. No one at the time comprehended these civilian words. However, the disciples of Simeon Toko understood later. The day they were deported, Pyro fell dead. He was gripped with an apparent heart attack while working at his office and died as suddenly as though a bullet had struck him squarely. Just like this. Bound. As for the other mysterious statements made by Simeon Toko, Ten years later, in 1960, the Belgians were obliged to leave their rich colony of Congo. But to impel this event, Simeon Toko unleashed his army. This incredible story is very well known throughout Central Africa. It will be reported in greater detail in another book. The event was witnessed by thousands of people on January 4th, 1959. Some of the author's own relatives were there, but so are there thousands of citizens of the city of Kinshasa who witnessed it on that day alive at this writing. January 4th is now a public holiday in Kinshasa and commemorates this event. Kinshasa was called Leopoldville. On that day, the cherubim and seraphim appeared and stood against the Belgian colony, colonial army. The citizens of Leopoldville saw an army of about a thousand very small men about the size of children or dwarves with very muscular imposing bodies. Each of these diminutive human-looking creatures showed great strength. For example, a witness saw one of them flip a five-ton truck over with one arm. The Belgian soldiers fired at these little brown angels to no effect. Terrified, the colonial army was thrown into confusion. The little men disappeared as suddenly as they had appeared. One year after this amazing mass apparition, the Democratic Republic of Congo was a new and independent country. Just like Simeon Toko said, you have 10 years, not one more or one less. After being deported and arriving in Angola, the real tribulations of the man of sorrow acquainted with grief and suffering is where to start. Never again would Simeon Toko rest. His life would be a string of nonstop attempts to kill him and prevent his mission. Let us follow what he experienced from Leopoldville, where he was unjustly incarcerated, to Angola. While incarcerated in Angola, the Portuguese authorities deported him. To the Colon uh, Col Colonado of Valle de Logue in the municipality of Bembe, northern Angola, from Bembe to Waba Kakanda, from Wakakanda to Hoke, 30 kilometers off San da Bandera, from San Dan da Bandera to Waba Kakongo again, from Kakonda uh, to Kasinga, Vila Artar de Paiva. From Kasinga to Jao in Chibia's Canton, from Chibia back to Sanda Bandera, from Sanda Bandera to Makamedes in the municipality of Porto Alexandri, or more precisely at Ponta Albina, from Ponta Albina to Luanda, the capital of Angola. I slaughtered those names, but he was bounced all over. They kept sending him all over, just sending him around for just telling people to come back to the commandments and simply spreading the word and being able to work miracles like the Savior. All these deportations took place in a 12-year period. Simeon Toko's captivity in these prisons and agriculture compounds lasted for three months, as at Sanda Bandera, to as long as five years as at Ponta Albina. The objectives of these deportations were to reduce Simeon Toko's influence and to dismantle his church. Sound like the Savior? Contrarily, everywhere he and his followers were sent, they indoctrinated even more and more members into the belief what the Portuguese called Tokoism. And in the end, the Portuguese authorities decided to use their last measure. Simeon Toko must be destroyed, they said. Thus, when he was sent to slavery in an agricultural field in Kakanda, in southern Angola, his head was offered for a price. Two Portuguese foremen, excited by the reward, decided to take their chance. They put a plan into action to murder Simeon Toko. 
During a stay in Angola in 1994, we collected the testimony of Pastor Adelino Kanhandi, who was the cook at the Kakanda Agricultural Compound. He saw what happened. Busy with cooking, he heard a voice calling him, Kanhandi, Kanhandi, come here! It was Simeon Toko. Once outside, surprised and curious, Toko told them to stand there and be watchful. Once again, the Son of Man will be tested, he said. Strange words in particular for Khan Handi, who was not then a Christian and didn't understand the term or what Simeon Toko wanted of him. Curious, he watched. One of the por Portuguese foremen showed up and hailed Simeon Toko. Hey Simeon, you see that tractor over there? There are weeds clogging that sower. Go clean them out. Submissively, the docile prisoner crawled under the engine to fix it. When he was under the engine, the foreman sitting in the driver's seat started it up, which automatically activated the rotating blades of the seed sower. Simeon Toko's body was instantly severed into several pieces. Terrified, Kanhandi, the chef, the cook, stood frozen to the spot watching. The foreman shifted it into reverse to back up and check the damage. A second foreman who was in service that day flashed a victory sign indicating that they had succeeded. Then the unbelievable happened. Before Don Handi and the two Portuguese accomplices, the body of Simeon Toko recomposed itself. Simeon Toko stood up. Don Handi could not believe his eyes. The Portuguese man ran away in terror. From that day on, Don Handi believed in Ndambi, the creator. And his entire family converted to the church of Simeon Toko. It was also that day that Simeon Toko made it known who he was behind that smallpox marred face, purposely behaving in accord with the following scripture. Therefore do my father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man take it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. John chapter 10 verses 17 and 18. During Simeon Toko's stay in Luanda, the capital of Angola, while he was in the process of being deported for the ninth time, another event happened to show his hidden and true identity. We should say that when he came on earth in Palestine, Christ himself referred in the third person Using the term the Son of Man, this time Kanhandi was one of the rare persons to hear of Christ refer to himself differently. Simeon was usually spoke, Simeon most usually spoke of Jesu Cristo, which meant to his followers that he too was just a servant of the Savior, like everybody else. Despite the miracles happening around him, he was just like a shadow. No one knew who he really was. The Vatican and the Avatar. His followers were once again bewildered when they found out that two top-level emissaries had been dispatched by Pope John Paul, by, I'm sorry, by Pope John the 23rd to Angola to meet Simeon Toko and deliver a personal message to him. One of the emissaries was unfortunate to fall ill with dysentery uh, when he arrived in Luanda and wound up in a hospital. The other was received by Simeon Toko, and he said to him, I am an emissary of Pope John the Twenty-Third, who personally mandated me and my colleague to come and ask you a single question. Who are you? Let us bear in mind that the year was 1962, two years after the fateful date when the Vatican had instructions to make public the third secret of Fatima. John the 23rd had read the message, kept it a secret, and very likely had sent his emissaries to Simeon Toko with a sinking feeling in his heart. Simeon Toko responded, I am amazed at a high-ranking person like the Pope is interested enough about my being to make you travel 8,000 kilometers just to meet me. The answer that you should give your master for me is in the biblical scripture. Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 6. 
Let's now put ourselves in Pope John 23rd's shoes as he read the text suggested by Toku. Let's go to Matthew chapter 11, verse 2 through 6. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the Messiah we've been expecting? Or should we keep looking for someone else? And Simon Tolko said to them, Go back to John and tell him what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, the good news is being preached to the poor. And he added, And zombie blesses those who do not fall away because of me. And now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Are you he that should come, or do we look for another? <laughs> Using a brief biblical quotation, Simeon Toko gave Pope John the twenty third to understand to what the Pope had found in the note written by Lucia dos Santos was true. Indeed, the former Cardinal Roncalli could have picked any name as Pope, but he chose John. So that now the scripture in Matthew that Simeon Toko sent him to read addressed him directly by name. Fearing who it was who was now living amongst the most disdained people on earth, the Pope contacted the Portuguese dictator Antonio de Salazar. On July 18, 1962, Simeon Toca was again arrested and deported, this time not to some isolated corner in his native Angola, but to Portugal, where his anticipated birth had been announced in 1917 in Fatima. For Toko's deportation to Portugal, a Portuguese Air Force plane was waiting for him. The plane had state-of-the-art telecommunication and navigation systems. In the plane sat a Catholic priest and members of Salazar's secret police, the Pededs, P-I-D-E-D-G-S, including the pilot and co-pilot. Their mission was to fly out over the Atlantic Ocean and, after about an hour's distance, push Simeon Toko out of the plane into the deep sea. This was the same inhumane treatment that the Argentinian military used years later against their political opponents. Supposedly, the Catholic priest was brought along on the plane to counteract the magic powers of the African through praying. But this skillfully planned project was about to backfire. The moment that the PIDG, PIDE agents rose to subdue him and carry out their murder, Simeon Toko stood up and ordered the plane to stop in midair. The aircraft stopped. It stood still, not advancing an inch, nor rising or falling backward. The crew was stricken by panic. The priest could hardly breathe and hoarsely huffed out desperate prayers. Desperate prayers. They all started imploring the a Portuguese derogatory term that refers to N-I-G-G-E-R. Simeon lifted his hands in prayer toward the heavens, and after a short prayer, he ordered the plane to move again. At once, the plane started moving. Simeon Toko related this story himself. For those who are skeptical, we would remind you that the authority of our sciences does not determine all that is possible on earth or in heaven. This same personality stopped a storm on a sea for a group of terrified fishermen 2,000 years ago. He also walked across the surface of the water and inspired the sun to weave and dance gaily at Fatima. As an exiled, I'm sorry, as an exiled political prisoner, Simeon Toko was deprived of all human rights. We describe here one of the many murder attempts upon his body during his forced stay in Ponta Delgada in the archipelago of the Azores. He was assigned the chore of maintaining a lighthouse there. At a future date, we will publish a record of miracles performed by Simeon Toko, which were seen by eyewitnesses. You could almost see, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 
Donna Lorinda Zaza is a Vati. Vate. Vate. Uh, a sort of prophetic trance medium for present day Toko followers. She experienced the following event as she saw it happen confirmed. I'm sorry, as she saw it happen to Tio Simao, which is a nickname meaning Uncle Simon, Tio Simao, while he was in exile in Portugal. Simeon Toko confirmed the fact of this event later and revealed the physical damage to the doctors that the doctors had done. Over the years, thousands of people saw this scarring on his chest. She said, you could almost see Toko's heart pounding in his chest through the scar, an almost unbearable sight, Donna Lorinda said. This referred to a most remarkable attempt by these astonishingly misguided men to kill Simeon Toko under the dictator Antonio de Salazar's orders. This attempt, which would have been the first degree murder if the victim were anywhere else, if the victim were anyone else, took place shortly before his return to freedom in July 1974. A Portuguese doctor had been reading records about Toko's alleged invincibility and invited several doctors from around Europe to perform an operation on him, an autopsy, under the pretext of, of removing a tumor from his chest. The doctors had taken him to a local civilian hospital. They put him on an operating table, cut a jagged mortal wound in the left side of the center of his chest, reached into the chest cavity, and pulled out his still-beating heart. The aorta and other arteries were severed by scalpel, and his heart was removed. Simeon Toko lay dead, his body covered with the warm blood that splashed out of his heart and chest. The doctors dumped Simeon Toko's heart in a metal pan and took it to a laboratory in another room. They ran various tests on it, expecting to find what they did not know. The gadgets and microscopes and probing showed there was nothing physically extraordinary or abnormal about Simeon Toko's heart. The doctors concluded that this purloined organ would not have been the source of his invulnerability. If it can be said that men can make conclusions about any such thing, the doctors had unquestionably killed this man in this macabre experiment, but to their horror and bewilderment. Simeon Toko came to on the operating table. His heartless corpse was moving of its own volition. He opened his eyes, sat up and looked at them and said, the chest wound by which they had casually opened his eyes, sat up and looked at them, the chest wound by which they had casually murdered him gaping open. Why are you persecuting me this way? He said to them, give me back my heart. For now, we will refrain from reporting many other significant events that happened that same day. We can let you know, however, that the exact time his heart was taken from him, Simeon Toko decided to give a finishing blow to Portuguese colonial power and rule over Angola. He returned to his native country of Angola on August 31st, 1974, with the confidence his words would be fulfilled. A year later, on November 11th, 1975, Angola gained its independence from Portugal. During the last night, December 31st, 1983 to January 1, 1984, when the death of Simeon Toko was announced by the media, thunderclaps of virtually seismic force and torrential rain burst the skies in Luanda. It had not rained in this area for several years. Meteorologists were mystified. For three days, the rain fell continuously. The occurrence of this event was attributed to all the rumors surrounding the death of this great prophet. A certain great politician was recognized as one of the toughest men surrounding Nito, president of the Republican of Angola. Uh, he was often called upon of he was often called upon for delicate and confidential missions. The Portuguese, whom he fought during a 14-year war for the liberation of his country, had a good deal to say about him. His name aroused dread and awe. He led a resistance group specializing in chopping heads with katanas or machetes. This man was one of President Nito's army of officers. His name was Comandante Paiva. After hearing the news that Simeon Toko had died, Paiva rushed to where the body lay, exposed for public viewing. He fought his way through the crowd of tens of thousands of people. He was astonished at the sight of it. He stood looking at Simeon's body and he 
asked to speak. He declared, It is not true that Simeon Toku is dead because he is invulnerable. To make such a public confession was blatantly incriminating. Seven years before, Commandante Paiva had orders to kill Simeon Toko once and for all. He told the public that this is what he and his men had done. He had Simeon Toko kidnapped and taken to a secret location. Once there, he butchered him methodically. Like a meat packer with an animal carcass, he severed Simeon's head, then his arms and legs, then split his chest and abdomen apart. Stuffed the butchered corpse into a large bag, tied the top with a string, and hid it in a certain location. After three days, he brought helpers back to get the bag and take it to the ocean and throw it to the sharks. By now, the bag had disappeared. The men began to argue about its whereabouts. Suddenly, in the midst of their bickering about who had moved it, a voice they described as sounding like the sound of many waters overshadowed their voices. Who are you looking for? I am here. It was Simeon Toko, in flesh and bone, alive, standing majestically. The men dashed away, shouting, He is God. He is God. But he don't call the Creator God or Lord. He calls the Creator Nzambi Ampungu and Mfumu. Mfumu and Zambi is Lord God. So who the Europe's told you to say, say Lord God. The true creator is Mfumu and Zambi. And this is the Messiah, Simeon Toko. This is the black Jesus. This is the one talked about in scripture. And he came again from 1918 to 1983. Don't take my word for it. We know a fruit by its tree. A tree by its fruit. All praise, glory, and honor go to Tata and Zambian Pungutulendo. The takeaway, with stories like this, many people say that if it was true, then it would be common knowledge. We would have heard about it. Yet this story itself is testimony of how systematically and ruthlessly the powerful group we have called the Cabal or the Illuminati have worked throughout history to suppress the truth in order to control the perception people have about our history, about the nature of civilization, and about ourselves. The article tells us that there were countless many eyewitnesses to some of the miracles of Simeon Toko, but we have been conditioned to believe that these are just superstitious imaginings of an uncivilized race of people or things that just happen on the movies. Part of our coming to a greater understanding of the truth of our origins, our history, and our nature involves our discernment about things which we have previously understood to be myth, folklore, or religious fervor. Everything must be considered in the context of the belief system, paradigm of the writer, and of the times, and is in this case, the Christian perspective, must be embraced fully in order to plumb to the depths of the story and evaluate whether things actually happen the way they are being told. We will probably be surprised one day to find that many stories of the past we have re relegated to the domain of insubstantial myth or superstitious religious fervor turn out to have actually happened. The Savior's come again. He isn't going by Jesus, Lord, or God. He's going by Mayamona, Mayamona, M-A-Y-A-M-O-N-A. -A -A. In Kikongo, this means he who sees. When the Portuguese colonized, they gave them names. This name was given by the Portuguese all for the will of Mfumu and Zambi, the creator. 
because now my Yamona, he who sees, is called Simeon Toko. Simeon comes from male child, which is talked about in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, I believe, where it states that there will be a male child born unto her. Revelation 12, verse 5, And a male child shall be born unto her to rule all nations with an iron rod. Simeon, the root of Simeon is Simon, semen, seed, male child. Simeon is Simon, semen, seed, the creator's name is Nsiemi. Nsiemi. N capital S I E M I. Nsiemi. This fits John 5.43. I have come in my father's name, and you receive me not. Another will come in his own name, and him you will receive. Nsiemi. Simon. Simon comes in semi, because semi is the root. Semi, Simon, Simeon, Simao, Simon, seed. Siami is the cedar. If you put an emphasis on the S, Siami becomes Nziami. And if you put an emphasis at the end and put a B in there, Nziami turns into Nzambi. And these are the Nazaleti. We've been told it's the Nazareth. These people, the Nazaleti, they speak with nasal consonants because it allows vibrations in our words that emphasize our words, which provide power when we speak in the native language of mankind, Kikongo. Siami. Nsiemi, Nzambi. Do you hear it? Siemi, Nsiemi, Nzambi. Do you hear how much more emphasized that is? Nzambi. Nzambi. Worshippers of Nzambi are those who are going to be raised from the dead. Simon Toko, before he went, he said, You want me to go? You're trying to kill me? Okay. But in the future, there's going to be more like me, and you won't be able to stop them. 1918 to 1983 was when this all occurred. 1950, they start coming out with something called the Tell a Vision, where they're going to tell you a vision. And they say, look out, zombies are coming, the apocalypse, zombie apocalypse. Because Simon Toko said, which when he was raised back from the dead, he said, ah, zombie. Because he worshipped in zombie. He said, oh, nzambi ampungu, nzambi ampungu. Tata nzambi. Simon Toko or Simeon Toko was called King of Congo. Because he's the Messiah, the King. King of Congo. Fits the description of the Savior in Revelation chapter 12, verse uh, Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Hair white like wool, as white as snow, feet like polished bronze, as if refined in a furnace. Fits the description in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 5, where it says, uh, He will have no uh, no, no comeliness nor form that we should desire him, no beauty that we should desire him. Fits the description in uh, Daniel chapter 10, verse 6, where it says, His arms and his feet were like polished bronze. Did everything the Savior did in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Called King of Congo. 
about 1950, 1960, maybe 1970, all the way up until present. They keep making them to program us and tell us a vision. Look out, the world! Look out, there's a giant monkey coming! King Kong! And who will we fight him with? G.O.D. Zillow, the fire-breathing dragon serpent. This is why Simeon Toko didn't call the creator God. Because God refers to the dragon. Lord refers to the dragon. Lord means ball. B-A-A-L. Which is the deity that was in opposition to the Most High and the Savior. In Judges chapter 2 verse 11. Long before the Savior came. The Savior was never called Lord. Because Baal means Lord. And he was called Lord back in Judges. And then the Savior comes along thousand years later maybe. He wasn't called the same title that the enemy was called. But the Savior has come again. His name is Simeon Toko. Simeon, Simon, Simao. The seed. This goes back to a childhood game. You probably remember. Simon says. Well, Simon says. If Simon says to do something, you have to do it. Who's Simon? The Savior, the Creator, because when you wouldn't do what Simon said, you're out. Where do you think that comes from? From Scripture, when you didn't do what the, what the Creator said, the law, you were out. If you don't do what the Savior says now, it's not too late sisters and brothers. And if you hear this message and you call on Jesus, you call on Lord, you call on God, I would put all that aside and start focusing on the commandments. Because the Savior said in Matthew 19, verse 17, if you are to receive everlasting life, you must keep the commandments. The Savior called himself the law in John chapter 5, verses 45 and 46. He said, Moses wrote about me. In John chapter 8, verse 47, he says, You don't belong to the Creator. Those who belong to him, anyone who belongs to the Creator listens to him. The Savior said to the religious people at the time in John chapter 8, verses 54 and 55, You say he's our God, but you don't even know him. I know him and I obey him. This is why the Savior said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, Many will come saying, Savior, Savior! He said, not everyone who says, Savior, Savior, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Many will come saying, Savior, Savior, we cast out demons in your name and we prophesied in your name. And I will tell them, get away from me. I never knew you, you who break in zombies' laws. Because we have to keep the commandments. Now, we've been lied to about the color of the Savior, what he looks like, what he did, how to get to heaven. Now is the time where the truth is being made known. And if you hear this, it's not too late. Don't call on J-E-S-U-S, -S, on L-O-R-D or G-O-D. Don't say you're a follower of this or a follower of that. Start reading scripture because the Creator and the Savior were called the Word in John 1 1 and John 1 14. If we don't come back to the Word, the Word can't remain in us. I had a, a thought 
And I remember somebody telling me about how farmers used to do it. And when they plowed their field or even sowed, they would have long stretches where they would have to do straight lines. And the only way for them to do a straight line was for them to put a post in the ground at the start. And as they were walking away from the post, they had to keep looking back up to reference the post to make sure they were still in line. Otherwise, if there was no post, they could be all the way over here. Do you see? The post is the writing on the sign, right? Scripture. And if you say you're a follower, but you don't read, by default, we can't just follow the way. Because the Savior's called the way, the truth, and the life in John 14, 6. And nobody comes to the Father except through the way. So if we use this as our sign, and we look down at it, and then we pull ourselves away from it, several days go by, and you know how far out of line we are. Several weeks go by, and you know how further we are. Because people aren't just following commandments. Now the commandments were so essential that we've been lied to and said, no, we don't have to keep the commandments. That He said, I came to uh, fulfill the law. He did in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, but he also said, In Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of a zombie's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do so, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys in zombies laws and teaches them will be called the great in the kingdom of heaven but i warn you unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the religious people who just say they're followers you will never enter the kingdom it's not too late if you haven't been keeping commandments, I know we've all been lied to, but the truth is being made known. And now, if you read this or you've been brought to this, you've been pulled to this video and there's something stirring up inside you. And Zambia Mpungu is calling out his chosen, his lost sheep saying, you know my voice, come back to my commandments. Because he said, and, and John chapter 15 talking about the i think it's actually john chapter 10 it's john chapter 10 john chapter 10 verse 1 i tell you the truth anyone who sneaks over a wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber but the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he's gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. Let us follow him. Do you hear his voice? If you go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 1, open it up and start reading, and you will hear his voice speak volumes in the silence. Do you want to hear his voice? Go to Exodus chapter 20. Go to Leviticus. Go to Deuteronomy. Want to hear his voice? Go to Exodus chapter 20 and start reading. You'll hear his voice. If there's any sheep out there, the Savior came again. 
that's the second coming. It's time to get our houses in order. Let us prepare because the king is coming back. And to those who are prepared and ready for the king's return, you will open the door and greet him and he'll put on an apron and serve you. But to those who aren't ready, who spend their time drinking and getting drunk and feasting and beating their servants and abusing people, he'll show up when you're least expecting it and he'll cut you into pieces like the White people tried to do to Simeon Tokel. All praise, glory, and honor go to Tatan, Zambia, and Pumutulando, and the Bufumu Simao Tokel. Okay, but Tatan, Zambia, may your message fall upon not deaf ears and Bufumu, but instead those who come to you, Bufumu. Looking for shelter, looking for refuge, Bufumu. May you allow your wings to spring out that we may take. Take comfort and refuge in the shadow of your wings, my father. And Zambiampungu, may you allow your word to shine on those that are walking in darkness, that they may come back to you, Mfumu. For we have stumbled so far from your words, from your way, but we know that your mercy and grace continue to shine more so than your anger, Mfumu. And thank you for not allowing your anger to kindle against this land and destroy us, but you've given us one more opportunity. You've awakened us one more time that we may come back to you, Mfumu. Thank you for sending your son once more to not judge this world yet, but to call those out who are in the darkness as one more call. Last call. May those who have ears to hear and eyes to see come back to you, Mufumu. For we know you are not in this world and of this world, but we know you are here in this word and of this word. We love you, Mufumu and Zambiampungu. And we pray all these things in the precious name of our Savior, Mufumu Simautoko, Kusu Okongo, Mayamona. Mfumu Yesu Muisi Nazaleti Nata Tanzambi Ingita